Hello and welcome to Atlantic Conversations. I'm Fanula Sweeney. The Atlantic Fellowship Program works with a diverse community of leaders around the world with a common commitment to fairer, healthier, more inclusive societies. Through its seven programs focused on equity and healthcare, socio-economic equity and racial equity, the Atlantic Fellowships offer those leaders an opportunity to gain new perspectives and new colleagues while strengthening their confidence in their work for change. In each podcast, I'll be speaking to an Atlantic Fellow about their work and ambitions for a more just world. For this series, I travelled to Cape Town to meet up with some of the first Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity South Africa at Takano. Today, I'm joined by Shannon Morgan. Shannon is a project coordinator for a community-based inclusive development program that works in rural areas, focusing on people with disabilities. I began by asking Shannon how she came to work in this field. I qualified as an occupational therapist and found myself working in a rural hospital, very rural. Access to health for people with disabilities became something that I really wanted to learn more about to understand better. I realized even where there's high levels of poverty, people were spending most of their social grants on accessing health care. How could we create services that are closer to people's homes, that are more accessible, that you could see people not becoming more ill and more disabled as a result of poor access? We had a lady who had contracted tuberculosis of her spine and her family was carrying her on a single bed up a hill to get her to a clinic. That was her closest facility. And if she had to get to the hospital, she had to spend 600 rand one way, which for a turn is 1,200 rand. That is almost her whole social grant for the month that she was spending on just accessing health care. And this is because it's a rural area and there isn't public transport? Exactly. I mean, there are some tar roads, mostly gravel roads. It's very hilly. So if you have a disability, it's hard to even maneuver a wheelchair in the area. So you find many people actually use wheelbarrows to get their family members to the hospital. So how do you begin to bridge that gap between the person who needs help and getting them access? We have community disability workers who work with us in the communities, visiting people in their homes. So yeah. you decided to start this yourself? The rehabilitation department at Zitulela Hospital was approached by a funder to ask whether they'd want to start a CBR program, a community-based rehabilitation program. I'd left Zitulele by then, but I felt that I'd really want to start this because I'd been working in the hospital, seeing all these issues, but never felt I could bridge the gap between the facility and the community. And this was a perfect opportunity. There was one particular story that really made you want to do this? It was one young girl who had been abducted to be married. She jumped out of a vehicle on the main highway and she had a terrible brain injury and just lay in bed for months until she passed away. Another one was a child with epilepsy. His appendix burst and he became disabled as a result. And he was the first child I ever saw on my first day working. I remember the mom started crying and I started crying and I was like, I don't know if I can do this. Many years later, I saw him again and his main caregiver at that point was his grandmother. His grandmother passed away and I think within the space of a month or two, he'd passed away as well. Because of lack of access to care. Lack of access to care and not having someone to care for him anymore. How common is this, not just in the area you work in, but in the country as a whole? Where there's poverty and where there's ill health, there's disability. So if you look at Cape Town as compared to like where I'm staying, it's completely different, but you still have areas of poverty within that. Where is there help for an organization like yours to make what you want to do a reality? It has a lot to do with political will and our Department of Health, our Department of Social Development getting on board and saying, how do we create accessible services? I have a particular passion on mental health. And in our area, we still see people being bound up and brought into hospital because there's no ambulance services that are operating in the area. So the family can't contact them. The police services aren't supporting it. So people's human rights are also being violated in that sense. In a country which has a constitution that guarantees healthcare as a right. We can create awareness that we really need 
the department and the government to step in and say, okay, we see this happening, these violations, how do we address this? And how do we use people who've got experience like Rural Health Advocacy Project and the program that I've been developing with our team, what can we learn from them? Where do you actually get the funding to get these people to the hospital or to where they need to be? At the moment, we're being funded by CBM, Christoffel Blinden Mission. Their main base is in Germany, but they have a base here in South Africa. But you can't rely on funding forever either. There's some point where you need to get things funded through government departments and programs as well. I've had meetings with Department of Social Development trying to have those conversations about we can't just have community health workers supporting people with disabilities and doing maternal and child health and non-communicable diseases. How do we create support systems for people with disabilities as well? At the moment, we've got a group of women who all suffer with depression. They formed a support group and have been meeting each other for many years now. And they've just become advocates for mental health. I joined one of their campaigns in the community recently and it was just amazing to see women in a society where women often don't get a chance to speak, sharing their stories, talking about how depression has affected them, what does it mean for them as women, caring for their families, supporting their families. And I think it's those kind of stories that people need to be hearing, that Department of Social Development need to be hearing and saying, how do we support community people and programs like this. And are they the kind of stories that keep you driving forward? Definitely. You see the child with a disability that you think, oh gosh, this child's not going to have any prospects of ever leaving this bed even. But then you find these women campaigning for mental health in front of men and women and their neighbours and sharing their personal stories. And you're like, it's such a courageous thing to do. And I think it's that that keeps me going. Yeah. Being a fellow, what did the program contribute to your thinking and how you work? It opened up so much for me personally. It made me really question, why do I do what I do? Why do I do it where I do it as a white South African woman? Why am I in a predominantly closer area? What does it mean to do development work? What I realized is that you don't have to say, I understand how you're feeling or how this has been for you, but you can stand alongside someone, be present and offer them support or listen to them. It's easy for me to share my opinion. And this has given me time to reflect and go, Shannon, sometimes you just need to step back and hear other people's stories. Then how do you help those people or support them to amplify their voice? And how do you do advocacy? You said it made you question why as a white woman you were doing the work that you do. Did you come to any kind of conclusion about that? We did a lot of work on power and privilege and it was really difficult. There was a lot of things that was personal, things that I needed to think about in myself. It wasn't about my skin color or where I thought I was working, but it was about other aspects of my person and things that I'd experienced that I needed to delve a little bit deeper in and that I still have decided to continue working on now. For example, the coaching was incredible experience for me. I really appreciated that. Do you see your work being mainly in South Africa and do you see a value in the wider community of Atlantic Fellows programs where there are fellows who might be looking at challenges similar to the ones you face? I would love to connect with people and there must be similarities. I was chatting to Evie earlier. This is Evie O'Brien, the program director of the Atlantic Institute, who's Maori and a senior fellow from the Atlantic Fellow for Social Equity program in Melbourne. And she's saying the rate of suicide among people in the country is so high, especially amongst adolescents. And it's something we're finding in South Africa as well. It was great to get that affirmation that yes this is an issue that's globally probably an issue that we could come together and speak to. I often feel I'm not an academic but I have experience and I have people that have touched my life with their stories. I've recently applied for a master's in global mental health to try and see can I process what I've learned over the last few years and look at it in a more critical way and then potentially share that. This is something that the fellowships taught me. You need to share what you're learning and get input from other people as well if you want to create change or understand things better, understand even South Africa better. Well, Shannon, congratulations on becoming an Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity in South Africa and the best of luck. Thank you. That was Shannon Morgan, Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity South Africa at Takano. 
For more information, you can visit www.atlanticfellows.org. I'm Fanula Sweeney, and you've been listening to the Atlantic Conversations podcast.